Hi there, my name is Robert Asher and I'm a biologist at the University of Cambridge and I'm also a fellow at Trinity Hall and I thought I'd make a video today about a paper that just came out and this was a particularly rewarding collaboration with uh, several excellent colleagues uh, Dr. Frank Knight from the University of the Ozarks in Arkansas and Dr. Ramji Venkataramanan who is my fellow fellow at the University of Cambridge and in particularly at Trinity Hall. And I should also mention uh, Kristen Connor, a student of Dr. Knight's at the University of, Arcan of the Ozarks in Clarksville, Arkansas. So with that said, let me tell you what this is about. Here is the recommendation that just came out today in Peer Community in Ecology. And this is the title of the editor or recommender uh, opinion piece on it done by Mar Sobral, a molecular ecologist in Spain, and she really did a wonderful job helping us uh, get reviews and, and putting this, she was the referee, or the editor, I should say, who helped to get this peer reviewed. Anyways, the, the title of the paper is Body Temperatures, Life History, and Skeletal Morphology in the Nine-Banded Armadillo. And you all might think this is very peculiar. I mean, who cares? This is such a peculiar and unique uh, sort of thing. It's actually potentially of quite broad interest in the very uh, specific sense that, um, you know, in, in the days of, of COVID-19, one of the key symptoms of that is a high temperature, fever, if you will. In other words, when we have a pathogen attacking our bodies, one of the body's defenses is to raise its uh, set point, the, raise the point at which you start shivering, um, to raise the overall temperature of the body s to try and cook that virus out. And it just so happens that an armadillo is capable of withstanding fluctuations in its body temperature that no human in a, in, we hope at least, um, even suffering from COVID-19, uh, no human would go through the same kind of temperature changes that an armadillo does. And this is one of the reasons why we looked in particular at this question. So now I'm going to change tabs to um, the, the title of the paper itself. Here's the Peer Community and Ecology title page, uh, the title of the paper itself. Frank in, in at the University of the Ozarks really Without him, this would never have happened. He's the one who did all the work. Um, I mean, yours truly contributed a little bit to the actual field work and, and to the process. But basically what we did as a group was to um, implant temperature monitors in a number of armadillos over the course of three different seasons. The first season that contributed data to this paper was way back in 2014, 2015, and this continued through uh, uh, 2018, 2019. And basically, we monitored the temperature of, I think we ended up getting about 19 individuals, um, some of which were pregnant females, other of which were non-pregnant females. And we wanted to ask the very simple question, does the core body temperature stay uh, put when, when an animal is gestating an embryo? Because um, there is some precedent in the literature to suggest that when an animal is gestating, she will have a much more stable body temperature compared to when she's not gestating. So let me then show you a couple of the key results. I'm just going to skip, you know, you guys will have to look at the paper yourselves if you want to, um, you know, get all the gory details on this. So for example here, here, let me just skip to the ambient temperatures for these three seasons that we were collecting data. So here you see in blue the air temperatures for the season 2014-2015. In red you see the temperature in the soil over the course of about six months from October through June, a bit more than six months, eight months of, of that season. And then these black values here represent the temperatures that we took inside of Dr. Knight's lab at the University of the Ozarks. And this, it's a very intuitive result. So outside in October, it's warmer than it is in the middle of January and February. And you can see on a 24-hour cycle, up here represent the times during midday when uh, in Arkansas, middle of the day, it can be very cozy at, you know, 15 plus degrees centigrade. Um, the soil temperature varies a lot less than that. You don't get the, the extremes that you do in the middle of the night compared to during the day that you see in just taking the temperature of the air. And of course, inside, in the lab, this is all a climate-controlled biology building, so you it just stays in the 
low mid 20s 24 uh, 24 7. So that's the ambient temperatures and, and about um, half of our females were stored or were in uh, 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 housing inside the biology building so their ambient temperatures were very stable whereas others were held in these outdoor enclosures these semi-captive or I should say semi-wild enclosures where they're dealing with much stronger fluctuations in, in ambient temperature. So then let's look at some of the results of what the individuals are going through on a daily basis. And this is really one of the most interesting results. This is an individual uh, called Watt 3, and this individual um, non-pregnant female had a temperature monitor recording her body temperature about every, very between every 10 minutes to every 120 minutes, give or take. And you can see this very squiggly line indicating that she went through lots of changes on a 24-hour cycle. The other individuals don't quite don't show quite as broad a fluctuation. Um, and then the period of time when uh, she gave birth, I'm sorry, the red indicates gravid, blue indicates non-gravid. So all three of these individuals were pregnant. That's what gravid means for at least part of the temperature recordings. Um, and so while they're gravid, you can see that they're fluctuating in their body temperature. In this case, for Watt 3, just as much compared to when they're not gravid. It increases a little bit here in the not gravid side, but that's not statistically significant. You see a bit more of a difference in this individual, um, so that when it changes from red to blue is the moment, the day when she gave birth. And you can see that when she gave birth in this individual Watt 2, the temperature over a 24-hour period does go up a little bit, and it also goes up a little bit here. Um, but you still see these massive fluctuations. So you can see this is a day, the 18th of April in 2016, when her body temperature dropped almost to 31 degrees. Otherwise, it's hovering around 35 or so. So the take-home message of this figure from our paper is that these animals are showing a lot of fluctuation in, in body temperature. And this is not something that you see in, in humans. Um, so what else can I tell you? Another important result that we wanted to convey with this study is the question whether or not the temperature during a key phase of development that we think is taking place towards, it's about the time when the, the fertilized egg implants in the wall of the uterus in these pregnant armadillos. The question is, if that mother has a body temperature that's just fluctuating three, four, five degrees or even more during the course of a 24-hour cycle, and that little embryo that's just attached to its uterine wall or the days following is developing into an embryo, that could result in a greater degree of phenotypic variation. In particular, a greater variation in the number, not so much of the number of vertebrae perhaps, but the variation, right? So in some cases, what we see in these embryos and these fetuses is they have asymmetries in their rib cage. They have, a, uh, you know, 10 ribs on the left side, but only nine ribs on the right side. And we wanted to ask, does the variation early in development uh, in temperature result in that um, kind of phenotypic variation? So basically what I'm showing you here in this figure is uh, an individual, a couple individuals actually, um, uh, one here is uh, an individual called Quiche. That's the mother, gestating embryos. Here's another one called Watt 2. And early in their gestation, they show a pretty low intrauterine or intrabody temperature below 34 and a half, almost 34 degrees. And compared to the normal temperature, which is about 35 and a half, that's quite a difference. You wouldn't see that in humans, the pregnant female body temperature going down by a whole degree. Um, and the thing about these red lines is that these are individuals that have only nine rib-bearing vertebrae, um, and they both show unusually low body temperatures early in gestation. However, we d the result here is not clear, right? It doesn't really support a link between low body temperatures early in gestation and increased variation in, in the vertebral morphology, because here's another individual, we too, who also had a, an, uh, an, in, an offspring with nine ribless vertebrae, and that had a pretty normal temperature. And then here's one in blue, another individual called WE1 that had offspring with 10 uh, rib-bearing vertebrae, and that individual had a pretty low temperature, at least for a few hours below 34 and a half. So this was part of our hypothesis that we were hoping to get really definitive uh, 
a really definitive answer to, but we didn't, right? We don't really know if the temperature um, determines the um, the vertebral phenotype uh, directly, at least. So we need more data to investigate that point. And there's a there's a bunch of other things I want to tell you about this. I don't really have time, but what I will tell you about is one more result that I think you'll find interesting, which is especially behind the collaboration with my colleague, with my colleague um, Ramji, Dr. Ramji uh, Venkataramanan. Again, he's a fellow in the department uh, at Trinity Hall and a, and a, a, a faculty member, a, a university teaching officer in the Department of Engineering at the University of Cambridge. And Ramji um, teaches every year a whole part of his, I don't remember Ramji, you'll forgive me because I'm going to get this wrong, but it's either the first or the second year engineering course. All of the students look at the concept of a Fourier transform. And that's this image here. It's not intuitive, but I'll, I'll try to unpack it a little bit. Represents Fourier transformed, apply uh, Fourier transforms applied to the, um, the time series that are represented by these temperature readings. So time series, all that means is that you have some kind of phenomenon like body temperature, and you're taking it at regular intervals, let's say once every 60 minutes over the course of many, many months. And what you get is a waveform. It's a very repeated regular waveform. And in the case of these body temperatures, you don't need any kind of fancy statistics to figure this out. They're varying on a 24-hour cycle. And we thought maybe there might be some other um, repeated waveform that we could extract from this if we apply to Fourier transform. Maybe there's something to do with the lunar cycle. Here, let me show you then our summary of the, the Fourier transformed cycles in hours, showing you these two peaks. One is at the 12-hour uh, cycle, and another one here is 24-hour cycle. And you can see that these dominate the um, all of the temperature readings, all of the cyclical data that we got from our time series of temperature data across all of the armadillos that we that we studied. You get a lot of noise here. So there are a lot of other cycles in various combinations of hours, but they're all pretty much background noise. And the two main ones we get really confirmed in intuitive observation, first of all, that um, that these animals are showing 24-hour uh, cycles of changes in their body temperature, and to a lesser extent, but still significant, they're also showing a 12-hour cycle of, of variation. And I guess the very last thing I want to tell you that no one really knew before we did this study is the fact that, um, I mean, we people did know that the nine-banded armadillo is one of the, perhaps the only vertebrate that habitually has identical quadruplets, right? These are, this is uh, offspring from one fertilized egg that due to some fluke of cell division, they always... Uh, are born as identical quadruplets. So you'd think that they all be phenotypically identical. I mean, anyone out there can identify with the fact that twins, humans have twins pretty often, much more rarely triplets and even more rarely quadruplets. But we all know at least some twins and they're very similar to each other. As it turns out, the vertebral counts of these armadillo uh, quadruplets are not genetically identical. So here's a figure showing you one of the four quadruplets that has an asymmetric rib on, on one side compared to these other um, three litter mates. These are genetically identical individuals, but one of them has an asymmetric rib. And here's another example of that, showing you variation in the pelvic area, right? So this is the pelvis. This is a, a 3D reconstructed CT scan. I want to thank A.J. Lemaye, who wrote the program Drishti, who, that enabled me to make that um, uh, image. So anyways, and not just me, but, but Kristen Connor and uh, Ashley Saunders, also another student at the University of the Ozarks, and of course Frank Knight as well. So with their help, we made these 3D reconstructions, and you can see that the pelvis is asymmetric. In this individual, um, the the junction of the vertebral column with the pelvis is slightly different in this individual compared to this one and this one, um, and yet these are again identical quadruplets. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for watching. That's really all I wanted to say, and I'll uh, wish you all the best dealing with this um, pandemic that we're experiencing now, um, and maybe I'll post another video like this sometime soon. Thank you. <laughs>